Hello, May. Thank you so much for making time for this conversation. Um, it's, I'm really looking forward to this. I, I was just reflecting that um, we've known each other for 20 years. I think I first came to Findhorn in late, what was it, 19... 99, yeah, 1999 um, in November. And um, that, that's when we first met. Um, it's been a long journey of collaboration. So this is gonna be really fascinating to, to offer a space for you to share your journey into um, regeneration and, and, and being of service to this world, which I always felt that you, like for so many years of those years, you've been a real role model for me and, and um, working with you has opened a lot of doors for me and um, I learned a lot um, from you and with you. So thank you so much. Well, I thank you for the opportunity to do this reflection of the 20 years and more together. Maybe I'll get many sides in this conversation. Wonderful. Yeah, I normally start these conversations with actually asking people um, to reflect a little bit on what what moved them into leading the life they le um, led and um, a little bit of their own personal development journey um, in reflection to the work in the world because so much about regeneration is also about personal development. Um, so I, I would love to hear you reflect a little bit on how, how did this all start for you? Well, I can go as far back as my great-great-grandmother, who was a Guarani woman, you know, running in, free in the subtropical forests of Brazil and being lassoed by my great-great-grandfather, who was Portuguese. So I come with this lineage of the native wild woman, you know, free from Brazil and also some European blood. And, and uh, as I start growing up, I started to really debate with the two. I didn't feel comfortable in any of those two roles, in being the, the captive one or the, the one who comes and, 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 and abuse and, and, and high rank. And, and I, I realized that as I start growing up and becoming more conscious, I decided to start bridging these two roles in the world. And by bridging into the world, I was bridging inside of me these two kind of lineages. And uh, for many years, I think I, the way I identify myself was to disconstruct in society the dysfunctional parts. So I would wake up in the morning and say, okay, what am I going to, to activate? and just constructing society. So I was always myself against a social movement or contributing or against a social movement. So I started with anti-military, anti-nuclear, political feminists at that stage, which was anti-men and hierarchies and things like that, until I came to the global north and, uh, you know, inspired by Buckminster Fuller, when you want to create the new, focus in the new until the world becomes obsolete. So that was a, a huge change in my life because I start to activate things I wanted to see growing. So eco-village movement, transition towns, this and that. So yes, bridging the bloods, bring, bridging the lineage in my life and outside in the world and becoming an edge worker. So that's been like a constant in my life. So you, if I remember correctly, you, you studied with Paulo Freire in, in, in Brazil and, and then you also had a, a wild time of, of being a musician and even have a couple of gold records. And, and then the, the, the bridge into Europe was through Gaia Foundation. Um, or... Yes, yeah, so it was through music, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I was a musician, and I think for, become, for being a musician, you need both talent and courage. And um, I call my music Brazilian electronic music of courage and um, determination, uh, something like that. And uh, I had one of my records that were bought by an English record company. And in Brazil, I was doing at that stage what was called the world music, but nobody, there was not such a, of a label in Brazil. 
but somehow the global north noticed and i came to launch one of my records and uh, at that stage there were the the first pictures of satellite was showing the amazon in flames my record was dedicated to the alliance of the forest people because i was already an archivist i was very much close to chico Mendes and everything that was working uh, happening in the Amazon, there was a first alliance between the forest people. It was an alliance between rubber tarpers and indigenous people. And I was like um, a cultural attache for the embassy of the forest people. And I came to Britain to launch my record and the first pictures of satellites start showing the Amazon in flames. And somehow I was attracted to of uh, joining some of the meetings of the big NGOs, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, they say, oh, there is a Brazilian singer that has connections with those who are part of the Alliance of the Forest People. My record was dedicated to this alliance. So I was in the artivism and, and then suddenly I came to, um, to the awareness of the Gaia Foundation and they asked me to open a new branch called Gaia Arts. And I, that was the moment of uh, James Lovelock, the Gaia theory, and Lutzenberger was coming with, you know, interpreting the Gaia theory, the living planet from a, a global South perspective, from a Brazilian perspective. And it was a very important moment of art, environmental uh, movement, and theories were all coming together in London. And that's what uh, was a big moment in, of transition between you know, disconstructing the dysfunctional to start building the new. And this is roughly around what time? Late 80s, beginning of the mm -hmm. 90s. And then it was also through Ed Posey and the Guy Foundation. I, I remember the story. Ed thought you were working so hard that you needed a break. So he told you to go off to Fintorn for um, an experience week. Uh, Correct. So I was working this... Uh, cultural person within Gaia Foundation in London and he said just go for a week do experience week and he gave me a whole list of uh, people to meet Alan Watson and there was the director of uh, Finhorn Foundation Craig Gibson and an experience week in Finhorn is a very busy intense a uh, week because you work with so many layers and, and, and you don't have too much time beyond your group. And the last day that I was there, I went to meditate in the main sanctuary and I, I was in deep meditation and suddenly I hear this incredible sound and there was somebody playing a didgeridoo I never heard before. This beautiful man in front of me, I woke up and said, what's that? And then I left the sanctuary and said, who is this person? What is this sound? And people said, oh, this is the director of the Finhorn Foundation. And um, his name is Craig Gibson. And here he was. He was in my list to meet. And that was be the beginning of my connection with the Finhorn, deepening, because Craig became the father of my daughters. And, and so this, this is also early 90s already? or. Um... This was uh, already in the beginning of 90s, just before the Earth Summit. Yeah, because I was going to ask you about the Earth Summit next. Like the, what, because you've, I know that you've had this very long-standing relationship with the United Nations process. And um, I, I recall you saying once that you always wanted to work with the United Nations, but not directly for the United Nations, because you felt that that would allow you to do the edge work better. Um, so how, how did you get involved with, with the Rio Summit? Yes, yeah, so that was the, the very beginning of my work with UNESCO, actually, because being an artist and being an artivist, I was invited to organize the official contribution of the artists of the world to the Earth Summit. Um, in conjunction with UNESCO. So we did um, about a week before the Rio Summit in Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, and we had over 300 artists coming from all over the world. They're all artivists. And then we went to Rio and during the Earth Summit, we, we took over the, the sugar loaf and we had installations and, and events all over Rio. 
So that was the first time I really connected and I created my first report for the UN. And, and since then I've been collaborating with uh, UNESCO and, and then later on with UNITAR. But that was also the connection with Finhorn because at that stage was the first time that Finhorn then was invited to come and participate uh, during the Earth Summit. There was this very strong kind of platform for NGOs of the world, rethinking the fundamental relationship between humanity and the planet. And I said, Finhorn, you should come. So Finhorn came and it was the first time that Finhorn was also position into more a global conversation and um, and many other organizations so uh, agenda 21 the creation of agenda 21 and i was there um, and actually i became pregnant of my first daughter during the earth summit so she's uh, right now she's 27 so that's been 27 years well, that, that's interesting because i I was never quite clear whether Findhorn's relationship with the United Nations came before or after the foundation of GEN, so it actually came before. Um, oh, correct, because yeah. based on that, then I moved to Finhorn, and my contribution was to, because we, the legacy of uh, Rio 92 was the Agenda 21. And the Agenda 21 was a, a technical document as big as that, uh, fourth chapters, 21 chapters, that's why Agenda 21. And we were, um, of course, we end okay, once you have the agenda now, implementation time. And the first thing I did with Finghorn was to look at the Agenda 21 and make what we call the vertical integration between, you know, the field of the territory and the international convention. And it was clearly that Finhorn was already implemented the Agenda 21 without knowing there was an agenda like that. So I start uh, creating the, the case for Finhorn and I put Finhorn uh, under the spotlight of UN Habitat. And uh, that's when Finhorn Echo Village became a UN Habitat best practice designation for the UN as a model for sustainable living. And based on all that, I um, submit an application for Finhorn Foundation to become an associated NGO with the UN. So that was all on my transition, 92, 93, 94, we got UN Habitat, we became an NGO. So when later on in 95, we created the Global Eco Village Network that people start saying, oh, maybe it's important that we uh, align with the UN because the UN Habitat um, two was going to happen in Istanbul. And at that stage, you say, well, we don't need to go to the associative level. Let's go to the consultative level. So when Jen became consultative, we were already building upon the whole journey of the Finhorn Foundation as one of the first eco-villages uh, with an official uh, conversation with the UN system. How, how what was it like to be, because you were at the founding fam, um, conference at Finthorn in 95, where, which was in, called, I think it was towards sustainable settlements and sustainable communities models for the 21st century or something. And, and it was at the conference where Robert Gilman presented the, the report that he had given to Gaia Trust after visiting all these different experimental eco-villages around the world. And, and um, Gaia Trust had enabled people to come from, from representatives from all these eco-villages to come. And then early on in that week, it was decided that it could be like, they could actually create this network, which, which then became Gen. But tell me a little bit more about these, these, these early days and, and um, how that evolved. It was for Finhorn a real surprise because it was the first time in the history of the international conferences that you had more men than women coming. Uh, and there were as many people that came as about 300 people, there were as many wanting to come. So you know when you put, you know, you sound a note that is just right. And that was the momentous, um, conference that was uh, held by John Tauben and, and, and Diane 
and it was the first time that the concept of Echo Village was sounded and was launched and the network was created. Um, it was, um, I would say that it was a momentous, intuitive, um, co-design, co-develop, collectively developed um, exercise. At that stage, we didn't know so much if how eco villages were going to grow, if we wanted eco villages to be real models, if we wanted to turn eco villages as the model to transform the world. But there was lots of inquiry, lots of excitement and motivation, and which were then you know, structured through the network. But I would remember that there was lots of uh, enthousiasm enthusiasm for the, for the idea of eco villages becoming models for 21st century living. I, I remember because I, I was a student at Edinburgh University in 95 and I actually found out very shortly before the conference that there was going to be this conference um, up in Findhorn and I thought well what a great opportunity to finally also visit Findhorn and and they told me that I couldn't come because it was all um, sold out and so yeah. it took, took me another five years to get there. Mm -hmm. But when when I first came to Finton, you were very busy, like you, you had, first you were the mother of two young daughters, um, but but you and Craig had offered a lot of educational programs at, at Finton and, and you had started to build, um, which was then called the Eco-Village Training, which which ended up being sort of the, the core template for what evolved into the Eco Village Design Education Program of of uh, Guy Education. So, it'd be interesting to to hear you tell the story a little bit about the this because I I under, the way I I remember it is that once Gen was founded, the kind of and now what very quickly brought people to well we we do education quite well and every Eco Village has a certain focus and what would happen if we co-created a program so the. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think uh, it was, in a way, it was a synergy between Lebensgarten and Finhorn. I remember going to Universal Hall, which is the art center, conference center of Finhorn, in the morning, and I saw a leaflet of a, a program, Echo Village course in Lebensgarten. When I opened that leaflet that were, you know, promoting, I had like a, one of those incredible fluxes of inspiration. And, and there was this, you know, uh, feeling, I'm late, I'm late for a very important date type of Alice in the Wonderland. And I remember rushing with my bike to John Talbot's house and call Craig and John and say, listen, can we create an eco village training and blah, 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 bring the social, the ecological, the economic, and, I, and then the agenda 21, the whole thing. And, and, and then we put a whole group together. And at that stage, we created a, a DNA, which was the eight levels of sustainability. It was eight levels of sustainability. And we had artists, economists, uh, builders, gardeners, and the, the, the facilitators of Finhorn. We had a whole, it was really a collective exercise. And we created this DNA and we started the Eco Village training. Few Years later, Hilda Jackson, the main visionary behind Jan and benefactor, she also had the same kind of vision of creating an education that would be a different education, whole systems that could connect all the disciplines that have been, you know, divided in the world. And, and, and we start meeting for eight years, 23 Echo Village educators met in order to create guide education. And I was the one representing Finhorn because I was the one involved in developing with the whole group of uh, colleagues in Finhorn and delivering the Echo Village training. Did you, did you go to Finhorn for an Echo Village training or you already came for an EDE? No, I, I, the first time I went, I went to Finhorn because I wanted to start an eco-village in southern Spain and I heard there was this eco-village and, and I always wanted to visit but I was actually quite oblivious to the the whole dynamic of Finhorn at the time very strongly 
identifying itself as a spiritual community. And, and I remember when I arrived in, in late 1999, there was still this dynamic of some of the people in the community were strongly identified with the eco-village thing and, and other people were still saying, well, if you want to talk eco-village, go over to talk to me, talk to Craig, but, but not to me. I'm, I'm here for the, the spiritual development and personal development. Bit. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I did, and also everybody told me um, the best way to learn about this community is to do an experience week. And um, it was you and, and Craig who helped me onto the the program because at the time I was a, a poor hippie in a VW van and um, couldn't couldn't afford a program and, the, and they gave me a, a bursary and and it was it was exactly around the time where I think it was the first EDT or this one of the first um, eco eco village trainings was running so I I kind of got it by proxy but I didn't do the eco village training I I the the first full EDE that was then called a training of trainers in 2006 at Findhorn, that's that's when I did my my EDE with you and everybody. So, and and in terms of the evolution of your work at Findhorn, um, at some point you sensed something that was also when in the four years that I spent at Findhorn very strongly, something that I felt ca called to contribute to, which was the bridging beyond the eco-village bubble um, into a, a wider conversation. And, and you started, which like we, I remember that we, it was in November 2006 that I did the eco-village training. And um, then I'm trying to piece it together because I'd finished my PhD. Oh, wait a minute. Um, Seafall, the Seafall Findhorn story started earlier because it I was, when, when, how did that evolve? Yeah, so, so then, you know, I always saw Finhorn with this permeable membrane breathing mm -hmm. in and out. And, uh, and with the educational part, I had already this um, alignment with UNESCO because that came from my artivism time because UNESCO be education and cultural and scientific organization. And as we uh, became associated to the Department of Public Information as an NGO, and we got UN Habitat best practice designation. So my next um, attempt to align what we were doing, because we start doing trainings was not only, so was to align ourselves with the training arm of the UN, which was UNITAR, United Nations Institute for Training and Research. So I reached out towards them and uh, introduced the Echo Village and the Echo Village training. And it was um, another momentous, very timely uh, moment because at that stage, we were already moving towards, it was 10 years later after the Earth Summit. We were preparing for Johannesburg Summit and Kofi Annan had a working hypothesis. He was realizing that the Agenda 21 was such an important document and was very poorly implemented by them. And his hypothesis was that local authorities were the, the final implementers of the international conventions because most of the conventions are signed at the level or federal level, and it, it trickles down. It takes about five years to go down and to land into the lap of local authorities, who are those who are really um, in interaction with civil society. That's where conventions happen. When, when you is in the friction between local authorities and local communities, in the localities, in the territory that you implement international trends. And the hypothesis that those authorities were unable to decode the technical document. Therefore, they needed training in order to be able to interpret the agenda and translate into implementation. And they asked UNITAR, so that was Kofi Annan asking UNITAR to make um, an investigation, a regional investigation before the Johannesburg summit and check if this hypothesis was right. And uh, so 
at that stage, UNITAR, I was around in the conversation. I said, wow, and you're Brazilian. Would you please help us to organize um, this conferences to check this hypothesis and would you do so in Curitiba? And I said yes. So I started to help them in um, framing the questions and holding participatory events that were not so much UN, were already participatory because by then I was already learning how to teach and facilitate in the, in the great laboratory, which is Finhorn. So I start putting together uh, these conferences and we did in Curitiba, Ouagadougou, Durban, Kuala Lumpur, Lyon, in regional, and was right. The local authorities were saying, yes, very good agenda, but we don't know how to, and how to is about capacity development. So during the Johannesburg summit, in, we brought all the cities that we made this investigation together and we launched the proposition of creating a network of training for local authorities. And uh, I was there as representative of civil society because it was a type two partnership by the UN. A type two partnership means you have private sector, UN system, uh, governments, local authorities and NGOs. And I was there always sitting on behalf of Global Eco Village Network and, and so, academia as well, because I remember academia, that the last piece yeah. in the in the Cifal Findhorn puzzle was the academia that I exactly yeah. <laughs> so I helped to create this network, and at a certain stage, I can tell you later how Cifal Findhorn was created. But uh, suddenly, we moved from being an NGO into a member of the network of official UNITAR training centers, but that's another chapter. And I, I just realized that there's also a, a thread that supported all this, which was the UN Habitat Award that Findhorn got. And um, you were also involved with that in, with Istanbul, no? Yes, and that was the one I think I mentioned before. That was very much early in mm -hmm. the still just post um, Rio 92 and the DPI and the UN Habitat best practice designation. I must say that 20 years later, which was about a year ago, uh, they knocked in my door, UN Habitat, and say, listen, we've given you this award uh, 20 years back. We would be very interested for you to do, do a review of the work and see what else have evolved over time. And I spent a good six months, you know, looking at each one of the aspects, food production, energy, housing, social agreements, social contracts, and all that. I wrote a whole new report, and they gave us again, said, okay, so 20 years later, so you are redesignated a UN Habitat best practice um, um, model. Ah, I, I didn't know that part. That's, so that was in just recently, in the last Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, and because there was also the, the ecological footprint study that that really helped at the time, um, that showed that Findhorn had significantly managed to reduce the ecological footprint compared to other communities in in the UK. Yes, well, that was very much led by Jonathan Dawson. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we we did Stockholm Institute did a study together with a local economic agency. So it was very scientific and uh, they did all the numbers and crunch all the numbers. And at that stage, they said it was the lowest ecological footprint ever measured in a Western community. Um, so we were like, um, at that stage, we were very much ahead of time. Of course, we continue doing that and now it's in the hands of Roger Downand. We do not only the ecological footprint, but we also do our carbon footprint, which is very high when you think about when you start measuring um, the travels of those people who come to learn with us, you know, so, but it is, uh, it was a good moment to know that Finhorn not only uh, was the lowest ecological footprint ever measured in the Western world at that stage, but we also were the second 
um, uh, organization or institution in, in the whole of Mori in terms of bringing wealth and employment for the region after the RAF, Royal Air Force. Yeah, I remember that that was a really important piece for me, that, that, that statistic, in order to convince the Highlands and Islands Enterprise to give a grant to Findhorn College that then paid my salary for three years helping to run Findhorn College with Mari. And when they realized that Findhorn actually had an economic impact to the region, they started to listen in a whole new, new way. That was yeah. important work. So, so yeah, let's, let's get to this, the, the kind of genesis story of Seafal Findhorn and also how it evolved over time into then Seafal Scotland, because that kind of also mirrored your own life step a little bit out of Findhorn and to moving to Edinburgh and, and moving out into the world beyond the eco-villages. Yes. So when the CIFO network was created with those original cities that we have undertaken this exercise, the Kofiana exercise, we started to be invited to teach on those training centers in the beginning, participatory way. So I, I used to come or bring some people like Jonathan and, and many other, Michael Shaw, some of our colleagues, I will bring to the sessions of other CIFAL centers, depending where they were. And, and, and myself, I was facilitating many sessions as well. In a certain stage, one of the directors said, listen, you know, when you come to the sessions, people start paying more attention. The way you bring in the, the main, the mega trends of the moment, the way you teach and other, maybe you want to consider yourself to become a CFO because people are paying attention in a different way. You bring in a different perspective. The questions you are posing are making people to think, local tourists to do people to think in a completely different way. Maybe you could end straight away and say, yes, we are ready for it. What does it need? And I was very kind of an entrepreneurial at that stage and had to do, I was like, um, I felt for a year or so like a converter of voltages because for you to become an official UN training center, you needed the government to support you, the local government, your national government, the local government, the community, and the UN was a whole alignment. And at that stage, they, they were they are, they were completely different voltages, you know. And having to go and speak in the parliament, in Scottish parliament, for the first time on behalf of Finhorn, to align the community, exactly as you said, many many of our community members were very much still in that, you know, this is a place of service and for inner growth. And so all well, this is the, this is also an aspect, a very important aspect of service. And, you know, having to work all those voltages until finally, after some time, we were able to align because it was not only institutional support for you to establish a UN training center, the governments at different levels needed to also contribute financially. So it was like not only, oh, everybody wants to welcome a UN training center in their backyard or front yard, but to walk your talk and finance and sign contracts for three years and all of that was like um, a very, very interesting um, um, exercise of diplomacy. And as you mentioned way back in our conversations, like I always wanted to work for, for the UN. Since I was very, very young, I wanted to be a diplomat. And in Brazil, for you to be a diplomat, either you were born in a family of diplomats or you had to be extremely bright because all the exams were in French and was like, um, very very difficult and i went to france to study french to go back and and and, and to do international right i was doing i was going to do international law in, in the sorbonne in order to pave the way but my life changed and and suddenly i never i never done the, the the official pathway but i ended doing diplomacy anyway out of the box you know building my skills paying attention, studying, reflecting, acting and reflecting. And then suddenly here, here I was, you know, becoming for the first time a CEO. I was a, a musician, I was an artivist. 
and I became a CEO of a UN training center for 10 years. Yeah, that, that, that was when we started working quite closely together. That was because like, I moved um, to Findhorn in 2007 and um, that's when the, the, the first, like I think you'd already run two workshops as CIFAL Findhorn and then together with Gail and Fulford, we, we helped with, with the scheduling and the design of a couple of the workshops. I remember low and zero carbon housing and eco-industrial parks and sustainable islands. And, and then there was the, the, the Scottish hydrogen economy, which, which the Royal oh, yeah. Mail and Martin Blake got involved in. And that sort of paved the way for the, the next jump from Seafell Fintorn to Seafell Scotland, because it was yeah. at the Scottish government. Well, I need to recognize here your, your presence in my life, um, you know, Daniel, because you were very important. I mean, first of all, you were very much the content we needed at that stage. And when you look, if you go to the website, ecovillage.com.uk, and there is like um, a page with all the over 100 seminars, 10 years, we were ahead of the game 20 years. What local authorities are discussing right now, we were teaching, 20, you know, 15 years back, you know, and you were the one together with Galen, I mean, all of us, we're putting the most amazing conversations and you are very important on that moment, particularly because of the, you connected me with the hydrogen community and we start bringing the hydrogen conversation to the parliament to a Scottish government inside of the councils within you know where decisions were taking place not so much more Moray and Aberdeenshire and Highlands we start moving and working more in the central belt and you're part of this and what what made that like was there a request from the Scottish government or from UNITA to shift from Seafall Findhorn to Seafell Scotland. I, I never actually um, knew what, what the, the backstory to that was. Well, at a certain stage, they mm -hmm. realized that for Seafell Findhorn to continue existing, it needed to end to, because it was about theory, policy, and action. We were working in this triangle, but particularly because the policy was very weakened from where we are standing in Finhorn. In Finhorn was very, uh, very, and the Highlands and the Cairngorms were incredible places where we could bring lo local authorities and decision makers and academicians to see what was already happening with renewable energies, local food systems, housing and all that, which people could see. But in terms of uh, becoming a zone of influence for policy, we needed to be closer to the post where decisions were taking place. And I was already being invited by the parliament to hold some sessions there and we were holding some sessions. And at a certain stage, they decided to rename to CIFAW Scotland um, and to open an office in, in Edinburgh. And that's another chapter. And because at, at that time, Maybe I just want to briefly come back to, I love the image that you brought with um, a converter of voltages because I, I had that a little bit of how difficult it was when, when I was working for Findhorn College, bridging, like trying to land all sorts of master's courses with Harriet Watt University and there were others in conversation with St. Andrews and with, with Schumacher College. And I, I distinctly remember how I felt like I was building a bridge and I had to speak a different language on each side of the bridge. And um, in many ways, when I was over at the Findhorn side, I was sort of trying to speak up that, that um, there's, a, there's a need and a role for also the depth of academia and, 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 and influencing them with the deeper inner changes that where Findhorn always has had this um, idea of rather than preaching, teaching by example and and I, I, I was a strong believer that just bringing students to Fintorn you didn't have to put a lot of the the more personal development and spiritual aspects into the program because people would just in biosmosis begin to get very interested and uh, find out more but it, it was it was not an easy bridge to build um, and you've you've been doing this all your life this this 
edge working of um, bringing people together and, and there's always this initial thing where you have to hold the hands of both of them so they see that they have work to do together. How, how, how do you do that energetically? Do you have any advice to people who want to do this kind of work? Yes, I think, remember when we started the conversation and I told you that I'm informed by two bloods. I, I think that is part of my DNA, you know, because I was, you know, like global south and global north inside of me and, and being able to, but I, I must say that is not a very comfortable, if you don't like in, intensity in work, you should not take this, you know, if you like her, because it is intense, it is intense. And, um, and at the same time, you need to disidentify. So working in the edges, uh, there's a whole kind of uh, principles that I put together is maybe it's another conversation, how is to be an edge worker. But um, I would say that um, one of them is to position in the flow and letting life unfold through you. They're very attentive because like um, serendipity and by association, all those things, they happen uh, when you are very attentive. And um, some people say that may, I think you are savvy and it's not about savvy but, or, or being opportunist, but it's being really attentive because being in the field, if you're attentive, you can, you can identify moments where where you can turn something that is could be a really um, a detrimental uh, confluence of energies in something that can be really regenerative and progressive. But you need to be very attentive and you need to work intensively. So it's not everybody that can hold the intensity of my work. And I, I thrive in intensity and I thrive in alertness. That's how I thrive. That's my nature. Yeah, no, I, I definitely have I've seen this a number of times in, in you. Like I remember, like just two, two examples just came to mind when, when I mentioned to you that I was going to do the spiral dynamics course with Christopher Cook and you immediately said, this, this is something I want to also do. And, and even more so, and, and in terms of much more repercussions, um, the, there was a point when Naresh and Sophie were running the last, training of trainers for transition trainers in, in Totnes. And, and I mentioned to you that I would like to go over because of Finton college issues, I couldn't make it. And, and, and you went there and then you've basically brought, I mean, you, you brought transition to Brazil and, and the large part to, to, to South America. Um, maybe, maybe share a little bit of your, your link with the transition training. Yeah, it was actually, it was the first transition training you, you seeded in me. I mean, how important is our interaction over the years, Daniel? It's amazing, really. You seeded, um, and, um, and I remember writing to Naresh and Sophie and say, listen, I know, you know, you've closed down, you have enough trainers there. I don't live in a transition town because, you know, you, you need it selection is you already doing transition but i live in a village just who i am blah, blah, blah. naresh tells me that when he read the message he couldn't hold the door back because there was so much energy he said okay come and he remembers the, the tone of my message saying i need to be there i need to be there yeah so i went there and i thought it was um, really amazing because although i was in finhorn for so many years by then, I never thought Echo Village could be a model for cities. And in my perspective, I was born in Sao Paulo, 22 million people. I lived in New York, I studied in Paris, and uh, I lived in London, all big cities all over my world, uh, 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 all over my years, until I went to Finhorn. And Finhorn was, you know, at certain stage was an incredible laboratory, but was too small for me. And I was always thinking, how can we reproduce what we're doing here in cities? Because, you know, at that stage and until now, I say, you know, UN saying there's no sustainable future without cities and all of that. So cities were always in my mind. And um, transition towns had a very, very well thought through uh, methodology and, and process. It was 
very much connected to the two threats at the moment at that stage, climate change and peak oil. It very well, you know, there was a philosophical line in the worlds, outer worlds and all of that. And, um, you know, the, the steps that were not steps, there were ingredients for transition. And, and I thought it was a very, very uh, timely um, um, lexicon for cities and, and processes for cities. So we took, I took, I, I got one of the trainers and together we took to Brazil. It was the first time we did it. There was a history of transition towns where we brought transition to the largest slum in South America, Brasilândia, 165,000 people. Up to today, they are leaving the transition paradigm there. And it was exciting. Brazil, as you know, because you've been there a couple of times and, and, and particularly now, you know, seeding the regeneration. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very fertile field. And over the years, I brought so many different trends and everything we plan, things grow. And, and then, and then, and then th things continue. You don't need to be there nourishing because in itself, it's such a, a very um, synergistic culture where people start adding few more things and evolve and in the process and all that. So there is still a very strong transition movement in Brazil um, and eco bairros as well, eco neighborhoods talking to and um, yeah, I, I was the I was a trainer who brought that, but also I brought transition to Odisha, to the Federation of Tribal Women. I took a transition to Kibbutzim and I took transition in, in different, to different places. Yeah, the, for me, when I when was it in early, is it only a year ago now? Yeah, early 20, 2019 when, when I went to Brazil for a tour to when my book came out in, in Brazilian. And um, it was just so heartening to see how in all these different, like I went to um, Rio, I went to Sao Paulo and to, Corti uh, to, to um, Brasilia. And in all these places, it was like coming home because there was a co community of Guyanos and transition trainers that had a strong connection to you and to, to Guy education. And, and what that creates, and I've seen this in other places too, um, graduates of the, the Guy education programs have this wonderful way of meeting where they don't need to repeat a lot of things that you would have to talk through with somebody you'd never met. You, you just say, ah, oh, you you're also a Guyano. And, and so much doesn't need to be spoken. You, you start at a, a different level together. And, and it's, it's powerful. And, and they've taken it in all sorts of directions with Sistema Bay and, and, and sociocracy and drug and dreaming. And as you said, it's, 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 just, a, it's just such a vibrant culture um, and I, I really hope that uh, the, the country will get through this current um, nightmare they're living um, and, and come out with all these seeds finally sprouting into, into the, the potential that I, I, I see for Brazil and the whole of South America is, has such potential in, in taking a key role in, in the regeneration rising in my part and uh, from my perspective. And in all this time you, you were holding not an easy dual role of being CEO of Gaia Education and CEO of um, the CIFAL Center and uh, maybe let's let's move back to Gaia Education a little bit because it, because it also made very big jumps from being focused on eco-village design education. I remember us having that conversation of saying, how, how can we bridge into a wider audience beyond the eco-village conversation? And, and with the online course, Design for Sustainability, and, um, and particularly, I think that what, what is, has been so powerful of that work, and that's also um, largely your, your pioneering work, is this project-based learning work that, that you developed within Guy Education. I'd, I'd love to, for you to share a little bit about that and maybe some examples. Mm -hmm. Yes, so for some time I was serving both organizations and um, when they were small it was okay because I was growing and synergizing between the two in a way. 
but certain stage both have grown to a place where you needed two, two directors, two CEOs, you know, I couldn't do. And it was a good moment because the funders, the main funders of um, Guy Education, Guy of Trust, they were, they offer, um, you know, to um, increase the resources and Hilda Jackson, who was the main thinker behind Guy Education, asked me if I would become the CEO, because I was a director and I was doing this. I was always positioning, repositioning myself in the flock. And at that stage, I was looking at my life and say, how come, how can I do two things at once? And it was like, a, it was a call. I could not, I could not say, I'll, I'm not going to do this because there's nothing to do with my life because it's like, oh, we would like to double or triple the budget of this organization and we want to do this and this, but the condition is that you become the CEO. So for the organization to grow, I was there to be. So it was much more out of duty. So there was a call for service and I said, okay, I'll do this for three years. And, um, and then, so I went back to my board of CFO, um, and I said, well, I'm going to resign. And at that stage were 10 years of CFO Scotland and the board said, listen, look at what we've done. Amazing. Uh, you know what? Let's close with a, with a golden key instead of, you know, having another CEO and, uh, and, uh, and they decided to close it down to my surprise. They closed it down and then I started putting more energy on guy education. But I brought with me everything that I've learned over the years, being a unitar and some contracts as well, uh, some connections and, and, and all of that. So guy education has benefited uh, a lot from the legacy of CIFAO. And, um, and then I served it for three years and uh, until we were then a year and a half ago when the main visionary behind Guy Education, Hilda Jackson, passed away. And before she passed away, she called me to her house and she said she needed me to do two things, uh, to publish her book. And also at that stage was this 2015-16, the big crisis of migrants. She wanted me to start working with migrants. And I did publish her book and I start working with migrants in a very creative way in Sicily, uh, working in a very systemic way with charrettes and many, many different stakeholders and creating business, social enterprise. And at that stage, it was like mission accomplished. And then other lines of my life came and so, you asked me about PBL. So in this repositioning of me winning the organization of Guy Education over the years, a certain stage, I stepped back and I decided I was somehow tired of what Brazilians in Portuguese say, showering in the wet, which was teaching people who are already our peers, you know? And I said, if what we're teaching is really valid in a world in in disarray we need to go to the territory to the field and i start studying and i created this pbl project-based learning and start applying for funding for three years projects and to test this whole systems design the culture well worldview ecological and the connection in in the field towards regenerative interventions co-created co-evolved with the we're not beneficiaries, but we stakeholders and all of that. And the uh, universe responded. We start really landing very good uh, projects from UK government and Scottish government. And we start, you know, developing that. And we had incredible work, Bangladesh, Zambia, uh, Oisa, Sicily. And um, I, uh, right now I'm repositioning in the organization where I'm going to be taking care only of the projects because where is where my heart is. I, I remember because that, that was 
a time when I step also back into guy education more to help um, upgrade the the online curriculum and so on and and I just remember those times where we would have meetings quite regularly and one minute you'd be with um, ex street working women in Bangladesh doing uh, training in in flood proofing their houses and and in the next minute you'd be in Sicily working with um, African migrants um, helping to start a whole new business on Granny de Gaia, the, the, the pasta business. And um, and then you'd be at the United Nations convention. <laughs> and I just thought, where does this woman take the energy from? Um, and and and, and one, one of the projects that also happened in that time was, was our work with the um, SDG flashcards. And remember, you doing an enormous amount of trainings in that first year to, to take the flashcards to the world. Um, Maybe we should talk a little bit about the SDGs and, and, and your work with the SDGs um, in the UN system. Yeah, well, learning from Agenda 21, Agenda Habitat, Platform for Action, all those incredible international conventions that are signed on a federal level and they take long time and they're not implemented. When we started the discussion of potential set of goals, you know, a framework to deal with the convergence of multiple crises, bringing a, a convergence of multiple solutions in Rio plus 20. Before the Rio plus 20, we're already starting still with CIFAO. We start, okay, so we're going to hit the ground running this time. We're going to start training local authorities in decoding the international convention before the international convention is signed. So I created very much inspired by the flashcards of the transition towns movement that Sophia Naresh um, created and some of their practices. I, I developed a pre-SDG cards and start testing with the local authorities where around MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals and all that. And then when we sign, finally sign, between agreeing 20 12 and 2015, there were three years of negotiation, uh, 83 national um, uh, consultations and all of that. And I start developing together with you. And when we sign, I say, okay, let's create the SDG cards, which you done in an amazing systemic way that only you could do because you had this insight which was, I mean, we together synergistic, I think in, in a co-developing way um, that every SDG should be seen from the cultural, ecologic, economical, economic and social perspective. And, and then you develop, start developing all those questions and the amazing. So you develop the content and I was preparing the field. A certain stage, I mentioned to UNESCO, listen, I have, a, I'm prototyping here, da, 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 this process of, you know, and they said, okay, we're having a, a meeting in Bonn and we'll give you a session to test your material. And I, we had a prototype, you run and we printed an incredible work of Alexandre as well, our head of branding with images. And the most amazing is that 80% of the images in the cards where work that we're doing the ground so we're not thinking theory we were like project-based uh, learning embedded in the cards and um, it was very successful it was like uh, um, hot buns you know everybody wanted everybody wanted so unesco got really interested because everybody out of that session wanted a set of cards and this was where local authorities and educators from uh, northern countries, Europe and US and Canada, with the global north, they got a huge interest. And, and after that, we had this agreement with UNESCO. They translated the cards in all UN official languages. And uh, we now we offer the training and the cards have sold, you know, sometimes we sell 200 sets for Mexican. So it is a, it is a very, very uh, alive tool for the implementation of the SDGs. And, and through, because you took it also to Chile for this, this social entrepreneur forum and, and um, connected with the, 
the BMW Responsible Leader, Leaders Foundation. That, that, that's been a recent, another part of your work. Um, how, how, how is that developing and are you, are you still working with them? Yes, yeah, so um, it, I was invited to come um, and to really facilitate a, a big discussion on SDGs in different fora during this meeting in Chile. And it went, um, and so I brought a whole team together uh, of, uh, you know, Guyanos in Chile and, and Brazilians, and we, we did, uh, a public one, a smaller one, and um, yes, and out of that, I had the idea of creating a version for um, corporates, um, which I have developed and already prototyped, and I continue um, developing it and testing um, uh, the cards that are for different audiences. And you, and you also got invited onto the the UK reporting uh, because it, like there, there was something around the SDG voluntary reports of cities and the national report on on the SDGs in the in the UK that that you were closely involved in, no? Yeah. So what happened is that some of the countries, I mean, uh, SDGs or Agenda Twenty Thirty, um, it, it is. Uh, you know, countries have committed into um, reporting um, how they are advancing, and they are voluntary reports. And uh, every July, people meet in New York, countries, member states meet, and uh, they select which year they're going to be reporting. And uh, UK was a little bit slow in, in, in wanting to engage because of Brexit and all of that. So a think tank, uh, UK SSD, they decided to create, they are academicians, business and NGOs together. They decided to create the, the, the voluntary national review um, coming from those stakeholders because the government was not, you know, coming, uh, was, not, was not paying as much attention as we needed. And um, I was the chapter lead for SDG4, which is, uh, quality education. Together with other uh, incredible um, academicians, we did develop and we were part of this um, report called Measuring uh, UK SSD, and which we um, presented in New York uh, the year before the UK then presented the official one, which was last year. And you mentioned the word um, academia a couple of times because not, not that you as everybody listening to this will understand that you've been incredibly busy. You also, uh, in the last, when did you start? About six, seven years ago, decided to go back into academia, did a master's and I'm currently working on a PhD. Um, so, and, and through that, you've also developed a whole series of, of concepts like the, the moving from ecotones, applying the ecotone concept to sociotones. I'd, I'd love for you to share a little bit more about your academic work. Well, I'm a neophyte. I love it to start things that I have never done before. So I'm walking in your footsteps, but I'm well, well behind. Um, I've been a practitioner. I've been a reflexive practitioner all my life because I've always been, you know, activating reality, but also after that, I'll reflect and write it down. So it's not being like only an activist. I'm not, I'm when people say you're an activist, I say, no, I'm not an activist. You know, I've always been, you know, thinking about before, during, and after. There's always reflection on it. But predominantly, I have learned by being in the territory. That's how I have learned. And, um, and um, also understanding learning as a social, as a social exercise. The way I teach is always a social exercise of, making meaning together. It's like much more creating learning environments than teaching. And with Paulo Freire, um, uh, adopting the Paulo Freire critique of banking education where you see students as, you know, void of imagination and, and you there, the one who has knowledge and all of that. So creating learning environments. So being a practitioner, and I, 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 I 
I, I, I started to, I became an expert, I started investigating, and became an expert on social facilitation. There was something I was, you know, investigating and practicing at the same time. And I realized that maybe, you know, I would enrich my service to the world if I could also have, um, you know, all that I was doing with be embedded by, you know, academic thinking and theories and, and hypotheses and design um, researches and all that. So I tried, I went to do my master's degree and I really liked it. And when I finished my master's degree, which was uh, about uh, regeneration of um, ghost towns, abandoned cities in Southern Italy. And I came with three models of how this could happen and all that. My supervisor said, well, we, you've already halfway to why don't you do a PhD? So I don't have the time and I don't have the age, maybe next lifetime and things. But suddenly this stuff grew inside of me and I decided to, um, to develop a proposal and I was just being upgraded three days ago. I've been upgraded into a candidate. So my proposal has been accepted. Although they said that my proposal looks like three PhDs in one. And the other thing that they said that may you here doing a PhD, you're not here to change the world. And think about that, you know, it's a PhD is for you to, because it has lots of aspiration. And I, I took this very serious, I'm taking this very serious, that my PhD will be really how I learn to do a research, investigative research, and I can contribute and expand the, the, the boundaries of knowledge and all of that, and not take my PhD as a mechanism for me to change the world, you know, although I don't know what's going to happen. It's the very beginning. Well, I'm, I'm sure it will. I mean, I, it's, it's such a deep process, and I remember this with mine. I mean, I had the same difficulty of three PhDs, uh, even just in volume. Um, my, my PhD wouldn't actually get through any committee these days. It was only because it was in a design school, and at the time, PhDs in design were new. Um, I could, could get such a large PhD of 750 pages accepted by the committee. But um, just just as a, so I don't drop this idea that came to me when, when you were speaking about your master's thesis. I, you know the, the people in Aterra Eco Village in, um, in Northern Spain, in Navarra, they're doing some really interesting work um, in terms of, because the whole of Northern Spain has a huge amount of abandoned villages, a similar situation like in, in Sicily. And um, Tony Marin, the editor from, of Eco Habitat is uh, very much involved in this process of how to establish um, pathways and, and legal frameworks that allow groups of people, communities, to take over abandoned villages and, and, and re, um, repopulate them. So, so maybe it, it would be useful. Your, your master's work might, might be quite instructive to them. So um, we should remember, like I'll, I'll send you an email to remind you to, to send Tony a copy of your master's. So, wow, this has been such a wonderful, amazing journey. Um, as, as, as I said, it's, it's inspirational to, to s witness your, your path. And certainly over the last 20 years, I've, I've learned so much. Where, where do you see, like now that you're stepping out of this leadership role in Guy Education and, and, and focus on the project-based learning, where, what, what's your growing edge at the moment? Where do you um, see yourself stepping into? Well, the Turkish people would say a, a life well lived. Somebody had seven professions and the last one he or she is a gardener. I'm already a gardener. I have an allotment and uh, for a year now and I'm producing um, all my fresh food, most of my fresh food um, during the winter. And so gardening is a very important part of me right now. And um, of course, I just started my PhD, so uh, I want to have time really to study. I'm writing, I'm really enjoying writing, and um, I'm not uh, filling up my days. And the other thing is that I've always been, you know, balancing in my life to being a mother, a woman, and a world worker. And uh, the girls, when they grew up, got more space for me 
to be a woman and a world worker because they are all living in different places. So I'm going to be giving more spaces for my other facets of life as well. And um, definitely, I don't want to be, um, this lifetime is enough of being a CEO. I don't want to be in leadership of any organization. You know, the, the, three, the three horizons kind of, you know, being the manager, the visionary, and the entrepreneur. So I, I, I've done so much managing, and I think managing is not my 40. My 40 is much more the visionary part of it. And whenever I was managing, for a long time was like cutting my my wings in a way so now that i'm not managing any more people and and processes i'll be really wanting to thrive in the horizon one the visionary and who knows what the vision would bring you know uh, but i i uh, so i don't have more plans than continue doing the projects which take lots of my inspiration and particularly because, as you know, also very much prompted by you, I've done the course of regenerative practitioners. So lots of the things that they were already saying, I was already doing intuitively, but I got all the frameworks from Regenesis and reframing my work with PBLs and being part of, I contribute to the core group of uh, Common Earth right now. So the synergy with the regenerative development, with the projects that I have, with the, my garden, with my PhD, and balancing being a woman, a mother, world work, I think I have plenty ahead of me. That certainly sounds like it. There's, there's just one last question that, that um, sort of almost ties a circle to the, the to the journey um, because it's something that I've been recently exploring a little bit um, in terms of how do we how do we seed regenerative culture and how do you tr how does cultural transformation really happen and and increasingly I feel without getting the artists the musicians the the creative arts involved in expressing what what we have worked on in, in terms of courses and facilitation and projects and so on. Um, it's not going to be a cultural movement. It's not going to be a cultural transformation. We, we need the arts. And, and so I've been working with, with the, the people from uh, Playing for Change, that platform, on, on exploring how, how to bring musicians into messaging um, this vision of it's time to regenerate the earth and her people. Um, you, you've been while while you stepped out of your role as being a, a, a musician as a way to to earn a living a long time ago, you you've been involved with this this um, uh, is it an NGO? Or it's a it's an award to to help musicians. How how do you like? Is, is there any idea that sparks when I say this with regard to um, how do we get the mu musicians involved? How do we get the artists involved? Wow, you very intuitive. I'm uh, re reconnecting with the music and with musicians right now as well. Very, very early stages, but I, I think um, it is um, it's really interesting that you also exploring that because I'm also exploring that. I sit in this uh, board. I'm a trustee of Artist Project Earth. It was created by Kenny Young that just recently passed away. He was a very, very well-known songwriter and uh, him and Herbie Giradette and I were the three trustees for uh, over 15 years now. And um, the way we do is that we create um, uh, CDs and we remix with um, uh, some Cuban music and we get by Beyonce, Coldplay, Tottenham, and we and then we launch and then we we normally uh, we fund projects that nobody funds and they are uh, projects that are related to artists communicating about climate change or about uh, ocean uh, plastics in the ocean and all of that. So I've been privileged to be able to sit in an organization where we give money away instead of me, the other side, always asking or putting applications to give money away to projects that nobody funds, but has this spark of creativity and culture. And um, right now we are rethinking the organization because Kenny has passed away, but um, my connection with art uh, hasn't really, um, has been a little bit more dormant, but is waking up right now. So 
uh, watch this space. One of, I, I, that's new to me. Like I met Kenny in October last year together with Herbert at, at Delphi at a conference. And so it, it must have been really recent. That yes, a, oh. a month ago, yes. Oh, wow, I didn't even know that. That's, that's really tragic. Well, that, that, it's wonderful to, to hear that there's, again, as <laughs> there must be some kind of entwinement at some kind of level in our paths. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that they will keep crossing many times because we've, we've sort of uh, cross-pollinated between each other's paths quite a lot in, in the last 20 years. I hope it will be another 20 years of, of collaboration. So thank you so much for this time together. And um, oh, not sure what's that. somebody's really trying to get you now. Okay, thank you so much. Thank Wonder you. Wonderful conversation. And let's catch up soon. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.